If you've taken calculus, then you're probably familiar with the idea that lots of functions can be written as infinite polynomials, called Taylor series. For example, the Taylor series of the exponential function, e to the x, centered around 0, is given by 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared plus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed plus 1 over 4 factorial x to the 4th plus so on, continuing the pattern. And you might remember that, more generally, there's a formula for the Taylor series of a function f of x centered around x equals a. So these are infinite Taylor series. But often we want to approximate a function with only up to the nth degree of the Taylor series. Now this approximation isn't perfectly accurate. It will often be off by a small amount, and there is a bound on that amount of error, which is called the Lagrange error bound. And the Lagrange error bound tells us that the magnitude of the error has to be less than or equal to an expression that's very similar to the next term in the series, except where the n plus first derivative would usually go in the top of the fraction we have an m, and m stands for the maximum value of the magnitude of the n plus first derivative on the entire interval from a to x. Now you may have done a few numerical examples and seen that, indeed, Taylor polynomials can be pretty good estimations, and you may have even proved the Taylor series formula. I've done that too, and I've never really found all that entirely satisfying, because how could somebody even come up with the series in the first place? You don't just magically think of a series which has all these cool properties without some sort of prior intuition. You have to have some sort of idea in your mind that guides your thinking on the way to coming up with this Taylor series. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. But first of all, let's get ourselves in the right frame of mind. Suppose you're a mathematician back in the 17th century, and there's this cool new toy called calculus that people are playing with. You can differentiate and you can integrate, and there's this cool theorem that links both of those ideas together called the fundamental theorem of calculus that says if you take a function f of x and you differentiate it, and you call the derivative f prime of x, and then you integrate that on the interval from a to b, then the result is f of b minus f of a. Now you, being a mathematician, you want to discover something new, something nobody's seen before. And one thing that often leads people to new discoveries is thinking about something in a new way. So why don't we think about this fundamental theorem of calculus in a new way? If we replace b with x, and then solve for f of x, then it's kind of like we're saying that f of x can be approximated by f of a, but there's some sort of error in that approximation. And it kind of makes sense that the error should be related to the derivative, because if we are approximating f of x by a constant, f of a, then it's like we're saying f of x is not changing at all. But often that's not the case and the amount by which f of x is changing at any point is given by the derivative f prime of x. So it's like we're saying f of x can be approximated by a constant, and then the error given by that approximation comes from integrating the derivative, which represents the extent to which f of x is not constant. Now what if we want to get a better approximation for f of x? Maybe instead of just a constant, we want to approximate it as a line. And if we do that, then the error should represent the degree to which f of x is not linear, which would be represented by the second derivative, f double prime of x. So why don't we write down something similar to the fundamental theorem of calculus, but this time instead of integrating the first derivative, let's double integrate the second derivative. Now this looks a little crazy, but the inner integral here is very similar to what we had before. Now we just have f double prime of x instead of f prime of x. The only difference is we have an extra prime on the f, so the result will get an extra prime as well. It'll be f prime of x minus f prime of a. And we can split up that integral over the subtraction. Now the first integral is exactly like we had before. And for the second integral, remember that f prime of a is just a constant, so we can factor it out and then the integral of 1 from a to x is just x minus a. Now remember the left hand side is still the double integral of the second derivative, and we can solve for f of x in this equation. And we get the result that we were hoping for. There's a linear approximation 
and the error in that approximation is represented by the double integral term. That double integral term contains f double prime of x, which represents the degree to which f of x is nonlinear. Now, if you were to continue this process over and over again, say you differentiate n plus 1 times and integrate n plus 1 times, you'd end up with an nth degree polynomial approximation for f of x, with an error term consisting of n plus 1 integrals of the n plus first derivative. And this approximation is exactly the nth degree Taylor polynomial. So that's some intuition behind where the Taylor polynomial comes from. But what about the Lagrange error bound? This expression for error here doesn't look too familiar at this point, but it's actually only one step away from the Lagrange error bound. Let's write our error term again, and let's see if we can place a bound on its magnitude. The highest possible value that this integral can come out to is the integral of the maximum magnitude of the n plus first derivative on this interval from a to x. So let's call that m, and let's replace the n plus first derivative with m inside the integral to form a bound. Now since m is a constant, we can factor that outside of the integral, and if you start evaluating these integrals from the inside out, the result of the first integral is just x minus a, and if you integrate that again, you get x minus a squared over 2, and if you integrate that again, then you get x minus a cubed over 2 times 3, and 2 times 3 is the same as 3 factorial, and if you keep on integrating all of those n plus 1 integrals, you get a result of x minus a to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Now we just write in the rest of our expression with the m and the absolute value. We know that m is non-negative from its definition here, and the n plus 1 factorial is also non-negative, so we can bring those out of the absolute value, and it's just the x minus a which could potentially be negative, so therefore it needs to keep the absolute value. And there we have it. This expression is the Lagrange error bound.